Hello, welcome to NPTEL's course on communication skills. We are on the second module and this is the third lecture of second module, barriers to communication. And this is the third part of the lecture on barriers to communication. Just to recollect very quickly, in the first lecture, we actually talked about the various barriers to communication. In the second one, we were talking about the various overcoming strategies. In this one, once again, I am going to talk about barriers in terms of causing miscommunication. What is miscommunication? How is this being caused? And how can we avoid, minimize causing this kind of miscommunication? Miscommunication can happen for various reasons. So, we will just uh, look at them. Overall, very quickly, we started with barriers to communication and then in this we will talk about the barriers which actually cause miscommunication in terms of interpersonal transactions and organizational network. And I will also give some tips of becoming a good communicator towards the end. And overall, my emphasis on is going to be on making you an ethical communicator also. Now, once again, if you recollect barriers are things which are obstacles to effective communication and we discuss that anything that impedes the free flow of your ideas from reaching the other person that is the receiver that is a barrier something that prevents active listening and careful response is a barrier these barriers act as physical mental emotional psychological blocks and actually cause this miscommunication we discussed again that these barriers are happening at three categorical levels. One is the sender receiver's personality. The other is usually when the transaction is taking place between two people or more than two. And then generally it is revolved in organizational network. Now, barriers, again you can classify them into two types, the external and the internal. The external happen to be the physical ones such as the noise, the climate and the barriers which come arise out of environmental problems, environmental situations. Now, these barriers are mostly outside in the environment and can be easily overcome. For example, while making a phone call in an airport, the flight takes off. So, the external din, the continuous noise by the flight affected to your hearing and you are not able to hear what the other person was telling. So, you can pause, you can make another call, you can ask the person to repeat the number. So, this external barrier of noise can be averted if you are willing to repeat and seek clarification. Same thing in terms of climate for example. So, suppose you feel very chill, very uh, shivering and while talking, so in your mind it is affecting you, oh it is so chill or conversely you are sweating. And then you feel that you are, you are just uh, feeling tired because you are sweating so much and you need some fresh air. So, you can just pause for a minute and tell the person to switch off the fans or switch on the AC. Okay. When you uh, just cool the environment, you can also like if you are feeling very cold, you can ask somebody to give some kind of shawl to warm yourself up. So, what I am trying to tell you is that you can always minimize, overcome the barrier that is coming to you from the environment externally such as noise, the climate. So, environment in the sense like suddenly people walking out and your students are getting distracted. So, you can just tell them to shut the door, close the window for some time. So, some kind of uh, uh, door repair work is going on in the next door. So, somebody is hammering and you are giving a very important lecture. So, you can go and request the other person to stop for a while. So, all these external ones can be managed, minimized, controlled. But the internal one sometimes becomes chronic. It is very difficult to control, overcome unless one pays constant attention to overcoming that. Illness for example, physical as well as mental. So, sometimes you know that both are correlated, psychosomatic sickness for example, is a kind of sickness that is conceived mentally and then that is revealed through the skin or some body parts because mentally it was conceived that the person has this sickness even before the sickness actually came to the person. So, illness both physical and mental, anger, prejudice, bias, 
mental detouring that is mind gets distracted while talking, daydreaming, distraction, fear, lack of confidence, nervousness. Now, all these ones are internal. Now, these are obstacles that are there within us and these may be a little difficult to overcome these ones, but it is not impossible to do so. So, let us look at some uh, strategies also. Before we go to that, understand why some of these innermost thinking are not that easy to overcome. The reason is this, because they are acting as barriers in interpersonal transactions and they are deeply embedded to us and culturally given to us. Look at this, understanding itself is shaped by communication climate, context and setting, background and experiences, knowledge, mood, values, beliefs, culture. Now, the lowest one values, beliefs, culture is very important as one of the uh, theorists in cultural studies says Edward Hall, he says culture is communication and communication is culture. Culture is communication and communication is culture, he is just treating them synonymously with each other, which means when you speak, you are speaking your culture, you cannot hide it and the way you speak is actually determined and governed by your culture, it is mutually dependent. Culture itself is like an iceberg, now why it is like an iceberg, because sixth, seventh of the iceberg is under the water. Okay. Now, the only the topmost part is revealed to you in the form of behavior and this is called as this uh, uh, famous cultural theory in terms of iceberg. Look at this, the topmost one is behavior, the one that is revealed to you and then the next level you have your beliefs, but these are embedded very deep inside you in terms of values and thought patterns. Now, these cannot be shaken so easily, it cannot be changed so easily and this is what we call as the iceberg analogy of culture and when two people come together on the left side and on the right side, on the overt side, on the top you find the behavior and followed by beliefs and at the bottom most you find their values and thought patterns. Now, the clash happens here and the behavior just overtly shows it, superfluously expresses that. What is miscommunication? Miscommunication we can say is a worst consequence of ineffective communication. People have not thought of the barriers, people have not thought of overcoming the barriers and that is why miscommunication takes place. Barriers to communication can often cause miscommunication. But what will happen when there is miscommunication? The end result is counterproductive. You wanted to have something, the result that is happening is exactly the opposite. The message gets distorted or totally misinterpreted or misunderstood. So, the communication time is wasted, the business climate is completely damaged, some goodwill that was earned over generations, centuries, they get lost. Why? miscommunication happens, mostly because of the inherent ambiguity in the language or the medium that we are using for communication. Why? Because a wide variety of meanings is possible with just one set of verbal symbols. The context will of course change, but the point is that the rich potential for interpretation makes communication difficult, which means you say one thing. And even if you specify the context, it is always possible for the interpreter, the audience, the receiver to take a totally different meaning which is not desired by you. Also the inappropriate and excessive use of multiple channels of communication which I briefly hinted at the previous lecture, so that also causes miscommunication. Look at the first part. Understand that language is inherently ambiguous or miscommunication is caused because of the inherent ambiguity in the language. Language has plurality of meanings, language is polysemous, language is ambiguous. So, we generally tend to play language games. So, Wittgenstein, a philosopher said that we actually play 
linguistic games, the way we play chess, we keep the rules in our mind. And then when we move the coin, we anticipate the other person's move. But if you don't know the rules, so then you cannot play the game and enjoy it. So we tend to play this game and communicate in a roundabout manner. Sometimes we don't do that directly. Many different meanings can be projected through a simple sentence. In the previous lecture, I said just a word like rich has 12 meanings. Now, let us look at a simple sentence like Suraj, the door is open and let us see how many meanings are uh, possible out of this. One can infer as many meanings as possible, but at least about 10 are easily detectable. So, when you say Suraj, the door is open, one meaning is you are most welcome, please come in, in that sense. Suraj, the door is open, implying get out, I do not want you to be here, who asked you to stay here? Again, Suraj, the door is open, let us go and occupy the seats. So, you are going to an auditorium or a theatre and then one of the friends says that it is open, let us go in, get in. Please do not leave it open. So, implying that Suraj, the door is open, do not you know that you should not leave it open like this, dogs will get in. And then another situation. Suraj happens to be the boss, the subordinate goes and then finds that some thief or somebody has broken the door open. So, he calls him and says, Suraj, the door is open, saying that I am afraid, I do not know what to do, tell me should I call the police. Okay? Now, another simple instance, Suraj, the door is open, why do not you shut it, okay, do not you see that. And then as a warning. Uh, Maybe the person keeps forgetting it, you are asking how many times you keep forgetting, won't you close it? And another situation, let us uh, assume that uh, there are two people who come to steal something from the home and then when they come and then they thought that uh, they have to use hammer and other things to break the lock open, but then uh, the person sees that it is just open, uh, the uh, inmate actually has forgotten to lock it. So, it is a wonderful stroke of luck, he says Suraj, the door is open, so come, I am happy, thank God, we do not have to use the hammer, it is just open for us. Two people are talking and then it is a very uh, political environment and then the one person says, keep quiet, Suraj, the door is open, implying that even the neighbours, the people who are standing out will hear us, so speak in a low tone. So, just as a caution. So, it can be used in so many ways and then can this be the first line or the title of a poem that you sing to welcome the sun god because Suraj in an Indian context is actually referring to the sun god. So, when we say Suraj the door is open or we inviting the sun god to your home especially after a terrible winter. So, possibly yes. Uh, look at this, one can write a poem like this, Suraj, the door is open, Suraj, the door is open, the door of our country, the neighbours door and my windows all are open. So, Suraj, please come, we are welcoming you. When will you come with your bright glare, sweep our dark floor and warm us all, Suraj, the door is open for you to come and cheer us all. Now, this can also mean that this is the title or prelude to a long poem, to an interesting poem, just like welcoming the sun after a very long and uh, cold, severe winter. Now, what about this language game? Why can't people say what they mean in a simple sentence as Suraj, the door is open, when they actually mean that the door is literally open and when it can mean 11 or 12 other things to the audience, why can't they be so specific? Because as I said before, language has inherent ambiguity, it reveals in that and it always enjoys leaving that possibility of a second or third meaning. And many people, to be frank, they are not clearly sure about what they want to convey. They do not think this is what I want to convey. They often speak 
and then realize that they are not able to convey their ideas correctly. They say, sorry, what I mean to say, what I mean to say, no, no, I do not mean that. So, they try to correct their message. Then, if you look at poets, politicians, people such as poets and politicians put revel in ambiguity. They enjoy this because they think that it serves their critics right and they think that the critics can invent many meanings and they can always escape with the meaning that they choose to. So, language has this, it has its merits and demerits, but to be a professional communicator, to be an effective communicator, you should be aware of this and then limit ambiguity when you are trying to send your message. People can enjoy language games as long as they are familiar with the implicit rules. You should ensure that they are familiar with the rules. If you do not know or if you are sure that they may not be familiar with, you better clear the rules first before you play the game. Now, today miscommunication has to be thought in a global context. Later, we are going to talk about culture and communication that is intercultural communication and how communication is affected by our cultural transactions globally. But just uh, to give a preview kind of thing, today in a global pool, so it is said that we are actually living in a kind of global village. This is because of the growth of MNCs and people are now acting in a heterogeneous kind of environment. So, different people, different culture, different language put as a mixture together and it is a heterogeneous kind of environment. Now, it was told to you that communication is culture specific, it is a system of symbols, beliefs, etcetera, but they differ. Ignorance in the difference can often lead to cross cultural conflicts. One interesting uh, example is the one that happened in terms of a conversation between the American and the Chinese on a symmetry. So, two culturally different uh, environment, but both the American and the Chinese happen to be on the symmetry and then the American had kept some sweet smelling flowers, very beautiful one, roses and other uh, flowers and then this side the Chinese had kept lot of dish. So, be it uh, uh, this fried rice, uh, chicken variety and then mutton variety and all kind of dish, very delicious and uh, so much of quantity he had kept it on the symmetry and both were solemnly looking at the uh, person who is buried there and then they are making their prayers. Now, the American takes a side glance and then he is smiling and he could not control his laughter. So, then the Chinese asks him, why are you laughing? So, then the American says, I am just wondering when your uh, grandfather will come out of uh, that symmetry to eat all the dish that you had kept for him. To which the Chinese retorted very quickly, he said that by the time your grandfather would come out and smelt all the flowers, my grandfather would have finished the entire dish. The point is perspective, cultural variance. So, what is appearing to be appropriate and right in one culture may appear to be ridiculous in another culture. Acceptance of this variation and acknowledging that and making modulations accordingly in communication makes effectiveness and avoids miscommunication. So, to avoid miscommunication, one needs to be open minded, tolerant, courteous and keenly perceptive of the non-verbal symbols. So, the way one shakes hand, the way one shows respect. So, uh, in some culture receiving something from left hand is acceptable, in some other culture receiving a gift from left hand is not acceptable, in some giving one hand is acceptable, in some you have to use both hands to accept. So, these variations and even uh, treating a foreigner the way the person wants to be treated. For example, in India, giving a gift of a clock or a wrist watch at the time of a person's retirement is considered to be beneficial for the person 
and thinking that the person will remember the one who has gifted it forever. So, whenever he looks at the clock or the timepiece or the wristwatch, so that is considered to be normal. Whereas, for the Chinese, gifting of a clock offends because they do not consider it as a good omen. Okay, they think that it is signifying some bad woman. So, it is better to avoid. So, no, what is relevant in your culture may not be the one that is relevant and beneficial for somebody in other culture. Knowing this difference enhances the communication effectiveness. What is miscommunication? <clears throat> it has been told to you before also, communication is action transaction communication is action transaction and this miscommunication can be viewed as instances of action transaction failure that is failure in terms of action and transaction leads to miscommunication. This means the speaker fails to produce the intended effect. So, then miscommunication takes place. This can happen because of misperception also when the hearer cannot recognize what the speaker intended to communicate or both. So, misperception. So, both sides there is a kind of misperception. When we look at some famous examples, so you will understand this. This is a classic case of miscommunication, again frequently quoted. So, this is about Walter Cronkite, and uh, he is supposed to be a very famous CBS TV news anchor and journalist. What happened to Walter Cronkite? So, let me read out the anecdote and you can follow it. It is an interesting one and you understand how the miscommunication took place. So, in Central Harbour, Maine, local legend recalls the day when Walter Cronkite steered his boat into port. The avid sailor was amused to see in the distance a small crowd on shore waving their arms to greet him. He could barely make out their excited shouts. Hello Walter, hello Walter. So, he heard their excited shouts as hello Walter, hello Walter. As his boat came closer, the crowd grew larger. So, boat was coming closer, the crowd grew larger, still yelling, pleased at the reception. So, he was so pleased that people are uh, becoming more in number. Cronkite tipped his white captain's hat waved back, even took a bow. But before reaching dockside, Cronkite's boat abruptly jammed aground. The crowd stood silent. The veteran news anchor suddenly realized what they had been shouting. It was low water, low water. Now, if you look at the analysis of this uh, miscommunication that has taken place, what was the flaw? in this communication process. The sender has idea that is the people on the side of the port. So, they wanted to warn the boater, they wanted to tell him it is low water, your boat will get stuck. The sender encodes the message and says low water, low water. Now, after doing this, the channel carries message, but the message is distorted because the way it was spoken the message got distorted and maybe it got distorted because of the noise from the boat or maybe they were all shouting together and they were not uh, speaking clearly. So, the receiver decodes the message as hello Walter, low water he decodes that as hello Walter. Now, because of this what has happened is you will see that in terms of the frame of reference if you look at it. The receiver is accustomed to acclaim and appreciate uh, the appreciative crowds is generally used to. In terms of language skills, main accent makes water and Walter sound similar. So, there was no difference when they were uh, shouting. And in terms of listening skills, the receiver is more accustomed to speaking than to listening. This was the major flaw. So, he was not listening to them actually, he was more responding, he was giving his uh, domineering uh, outlook, waving hands and then at no point you could suspect that there is something wrong.
Now, in terms of emotional interference, what actually acted in between was his ego. Ego prompted the receiver to believe crowd was responding to his celebrity status. He thought that they were waving because of his celebrity status and physical barriers, probably it was the noise from boat, the distance between senders and receivers, so it was not heard properly. Now, if you analyze this, which barriers could be overcome through better communication skills? So, if you look at it, you will not be able to overcome the physical barriers, because unless you stop the noise, which also can be done, but generally in the moment, this is something that is inevitable. But the other barriers, if you are able to lower down your ego, if you can be a better listener, and from the other side, can they use some kind of non-verbal communication? Can they show a red flag? Can they show a black flag to indicate that there is some danger, do not come this side? So, both sides, if they try to use another medium, another channel of communication, and if this person happened to be a better listener, so this flaw could have been avoided. Now, let us look at the third category in which uh, there are barriers uh, to communication. This is barriers to information flow in organizations, communication in organizational setup. Now, you will understand that most of the times the communication climate happens to be very closed in organizational setups, despite the fact that they can use emails and uh, SMS and all that. This can happen because of the administrative hierarchy. So, the horizontal and the vertical flow, generally it is a very bureaucratic setup. So, top to bottom, so there is this uh, director, then uh, deputy director and just above these two there is the CEO and then from the director and then this uh, uh, manager and between manager, deputy manager, then supervisor, overseer and then the worker, subordinate, peon and so on, watchman. Now, long lines of communication can also cause this barriers to flow in communication. Too many transfer stations distorts and delays the message. Lack of trust between management and employees can also cause barrier. Employees, what will they do if there is no trust between the management and them? They will turn to an informal system, the grey point. They will start believing in rumours. They will start gathering information laterally not directly, not through the reliable source. Now, competition for power, status, rewards, so that is also trying to create this kind of grape wine environment, which should be avoided. Now, uh, look at the available models. In terms of downward management, so, the management directives, job plans, policies, company goals, mission statements. So, it all comes from the bottom to the down. In terms of horizontal ones, task coordination, so teamwork, information sharing, problem solving, conflict resolution. Generally, it is believed that the more horizontally you are able to work, so the communication effectiveness can be achieved. The downward and upward, there are problems. So, upward it is going from suggestions for improvement from the subordinates, reports of customer interaction, feedback, progress reports, employee feedback. So, the downward upward, generally there are uh, barriers, horizontal is generally the one that is encouraged. You can also look at in terms of the written, oral and electronic. In written you have this executive memos, letters, annual report, company newsletter, bulletin board postings, orientation manual. In oral, it is telephone, face to face, conversation, company meetings, team meetings, group discussions, brainstorming sessions, etcetera. In terms of electronic, it is the email, voicemail, instant messaging, intranet communication, video conferencing and so on. Now, another uh, interesting example of message distortion, miscommunication that happens in downward communication and this can happen through five levels of management. Look at the message and the amount of message. It is believed that 
when the message is first written by the board of uh, directors, it was 100 percent. Okay, the board of directors wanted to convey something, it was 100 percent. But later, when, when it was received by the vice president, it became 63 percent. Then when it was received by general supervisor, it became 56 percent. Then when it was received by plant manager, it became 40 percent. Then when it was received by team leader, it became 30 percent. Then when it was received by the worker, it was 20 percent. This is deplorable. This is really bad because from the top to the bottom, 100 percent communication message slowly deteriorated, distorted and only 20 percent of the message was received. Now, another interesting example, illustrative example of how miscommunication can happen in product evolvement. Look at this uh, uh, picture. Now, this was how it was executed, the product was executed in terms of the way marketing requested it. So, it was mentioned as a three tire swing. So, there are three tyres, the marketing requested it this way and then you can see that there are three tyres. But when sales ordered it, so the three tyre, the three is there in terms of ropes dividing it in between, but it became a swing like this when sales ordered. Now, when engineering designed it, actually the swing part is gone, but then the design if you could see it has become totally dysfunctional, but it has designed it that way. Then when the production manufactured it, so again it manufactured it in this manner, but again you can see it cannot function because the tree is at the other side, then this became a problem. Then how the problem was started out when the maintenance installed it, it cut the tree and then it hung it and then gave some space, but again you know but this is a very funny kind of uh, installation and not very functional, not very effective. But what was it the customer wanted actually? The customer actually wanted a simple three tire swing. It was heard as three, not tree. So, three tire, T I E R, they thought it is three layered swing. What the customer actually wanted was a simple tree tire swing where the kid can sit and then enjoy. So, you see how communication is distorted, how miscommunication ha can happen. It appears to be funny, but then it can actually cause severe damage in communication. Now, coming back to the organizational barriers, how can the barriers be overcome? Now, one way we can overcome this by modifying the communication network. Instead of using this top to bottom, the downward or the upward, if we can have direct access. So, usually it will be said that you apply it through the manager, you send it through a proper channel, the proper channel may be the head of the department. You want to complain against the head of the department to the director, but the head of the department has to forward it, so ridiculous. Now, if you want to modify this communication network, then go for direct access, allow the person to communicate directly with the director or the CEO of the company, have a kind of feedback mechanism in which the person can address the problems directly. Then dissemination through several channels. So, suppose a message has to be passed, you can use notice board put it on the notice board, send email messages, talk to somebody on phone, send SMS, have a kind of teleconferencing and orally inform them. When you meet somebody face to face, you remind them, you clarify the message. Now, use several channels by which you ensure that the message reaches the bottom most people correctly. Then use feedback system involving more than one source, which means it will not come through only one channel, you will have so many ways to collect feedback. You can take face to face interaction, you have a specified time in which people can come and talk to you face to face, you have SMS, you have phone calls, you allow all 
ways of communicating with you. So, get the feedback using more than one source. And then creating open environment for interaction and feedback. So, it is not just creating so many sources, but you should not intimidate them. So, make it open. So, if you are able to make it the environment open, then people will come out freely and then they will be able to discuss. In fact, if you are able to collect their feedback at various levels in terms of goals of the company, in terms of the company's performance, in terms of what they think about your own communicative effectiveness, if it is between teacher and student, if you elicit direct information from the student as how you can imp uh, improve the course contents, what material can you add, drop. So, the course content becomes very enriching, effective in terms of communication. So, this is something that you should aspire by increasing the number of sources, by also going for open environment in terms of feedback. How to surmount organizational barriers? One way is to flatten the organizational structure. So, as I said, do not go for uh, top to down the downward or upward, just try to flatten it. Promote horizontal communication, so one to one peer group level and pro by providing sufficient information through formal channels, use many channels, give sufficient information. And today the major problem is handling this information overload. Now, every day the number of documents on internet increases by 7.5 million, this was taken way back maybe some uh, 10 years before. Now, I think it is double, triple the amount of messages we are getting and so many phone calls, so many emails, so many SMS message and then apart from that the updates in Facebook and other social networking site. It looks like as somebody said man has become a socially networking animal now. So, how to come out of this net and how do you handle this? So, on a typical day, the average office worker sends and receives over 200 messages, average, but there are people who are handling 1000, 2000, 5000 messages, quickly they see, they delete it. How can you do this? One, you should reduce this information overload and when the emails or messages are getting forwarded, it should be sent only to those people who can benefit from it, that is it should be earmarked according to the department, according to the category, it should be classified, sorted out and then sent to the person. One should not spam by sending it to your group when it is addressed to only a particular individual and it should contain only the main ideas. So, when you are disseminating, do not crowd it with so many uh, overload of information. One method that is commonly suggested. Uh, is to remember this acronym RAPID, which you can use to overcome communication barrier. The R stands for realizing that communication is imperfect, maybe for various reasons, the language ambiguity, the way we communicate, it is not very perfect, we use lot of crutches in communication, uh, we leave ambiguity. So, realize that communication is imperfect adapt message to receiver. So, use empathy, use language in such a manner that it is adaptable, plan for feedback, give room for uh, feedback and then improve language and listening skills. Be a good listener before you want to become a good communicator, use appropriate language, doubt preconceptions, but you do not be prejudiced. So, if you are able to follow this, so you will be able to overcome the barriers and as I was telling. So, you can improve communication by evaluating responses to your messages and do this as an activity. Change your approach by choosing another medium or by reworking your message, especially when the communication gap happens, change. If you use phone, then go face to face and vice versa. Sometimes even sending SMS is more effective than calling somebody and speaking on phone. So, use this change and then rework the message accordingly. So, that will uh, help you to cause effectiveness in communication. Now, let us look at some important traits of becoming good communicators 
and then I will talk about ethical communication before I wind up this uh, lecture. Good communicators are perceptive, so they are good listeners, they perceive you verbally as well as non-verbally, they are in control, that means their emotions are in control and they are able to control their verbal as well as non-verbal behavior. They are credible because you can trust them, you can believe them, they have created such a rapport with you, they are congenial, they are approachable, they are friendly, they are affable, you feel like going and sharing your ideas without any inhibitions and they are precise, they do not bore us to death, they talk precisely, they convey their points exactly, they do not mince words, they do not beat around the bush. What are the guidelines to becoming a good communicator? First adopt an audience centered approach, use empathy, put yourself into the shoes of the audience, follow this audience centered approach. If you were to sit there and listen to you, would you like that speech? Foster open communication, generate open environment for communication, create clean efficient messages, give up laziness. So, laziness is a major impediment, major barrier in making you an effective communicator, give it up and be ethical in your communications. Let us look at the last two aspects of giving up laziness and becoming ethical in your communication. As I said the biggest barrier is laziness, you should be able to give it up. Now to be a communicator is hard work, just a communicator is a hard work and to be a good communicator is very hard work. And to be an effective communicator is damn very, very hard work. Even listening, which many people think is a passive skill, we are going to discuss about that very soon, but it is a very active skill. And people say that if you listen attentively, you burn calories just like the way you would have jogged. It is a very active skill, even that needs you to be active. But laziness is at the root of our general reluctance to write, general reluctance to prepare for a speech, general unwillingness in coming forward and delivering a speech and making our communication effective and meaningful. So, laziness is the root cause. And the other thing associated with laziness is we tend to allow all sorts of distractions, especially when you are writing a document. So, somebody says come we will go for a coffee, you go for a coffee and then the person sees a poster of a movie, he says we will go for a movie, you go for a movie then go for dinner and then you keep on postponing, get distracted so quickly. The result, either we do not reconstruct the messages or we reconstruct them very badly. Now, the last and the final point is be ethical in your communications, today people think that you can be effective in your communication by hook or crook, that is the end justifies the means, no, the means are as important as the ends as far as communication is concerned. You have to be ethical, you have to have this discrim discrimination of what is good and what is bad and try to have good intentions. Ethics, when we talk about it, or the principles of conduct that govern a person or group. Okay. Now, when we say ethical communication, it includes all relevant information and it is true in every sense and is not deceptive in any way. You should commit to ethical communication, you should not deceive people in any way. Even if you are doing business, do honest business, be straightforward in communication. There are some quick uh, traps, ethical traps, the common ones are categorized into five traps, look at them one by one very quickly, the false necessity trap. So, this means convincing yourself that no other choice exists, then the doctrine of relative filth trap. So, this means comparing your unethical behavior with someone else's even more unethical behavior. So, you are asking that why did you steal this uh, 10 rupees from that guy? You say that oh that guy has stolen 1 crore, so what is 10 rupees? So, relative filth, rationalization trap, justifying unethical actions with excuses. So, his mother was dying, that is why he was compelled to steal, loot money from the bank and then uh, 
use it for payment for his mother's operation or something, rationalization. The self-deception trap, persuading yourself, for example, that a lie is not really a lie. And then the ends justify the means trap, thinking that using unethical methods to accomplish a desirable goal is fine, so it is not so. So, these are ethical traps, avoid these ethical traps and tools for doing the right thing. Ask these questions, is action, the action that you are considering, you ask yourself whether it is legal or are you doing something illegal. Then, how would you see the problem if you are on the other side? Will it affect you? Will you feel cheated? Will you feel disappointed? Then change the modalities. What alternate solutions are available? Is it like that, there, there are no alternate solutions or can you find out some alternate solutions? Then go ahead. Can you discuss the problem with someone you trust? Can you share this with your mother? Can you share this with your close friend? Can you tell this to your wife? Can you tell this to your small kid? Can you be as open as that? But if you hide, conceal, then there is something wrong, it is not that ethical maybe. How would you feel if your family, friends, employer or co-workers learnt of your action? If you feel embarrassed, humiliated, guilty, then definitely it is not ethical. So, these are questions you can ask. When we talk about ethical aspects, generally it is reflection of values such as fairness, integrity, honesty, quality, compassion and dignity. Ethical standards are communicated through ethical codes, although one can argue that they are relative, they change culturally, we all know that there are universal values. Okay. So, you know what is good and what is bad, irrespective of the fact whether you follow this religion or that religion. In terms of humanity, one knows what is good or what is bad, but there are situations where it is often difficult to decide what is ethical or unethical. Oh, I often ask my students this question and then I just uh, try to debate with them whether their answers are correct or not. The question is this, would you report to the invigilator if you find a friend of yours copying while writing a test arranged for recruitment of a job for which you too are an applicant. So, you and your friend, both of you are writing this competitive exam in which your friend is doing some kind of malpractice, would you reveal that or not? Now, the ethics of present generation has changed so much, the majority of the students, their impulsive response is to say no. Why? Will you not lose your job? They say that no, I do not mind, I do not want to uh, inform the examiner about my friend because I want to save him. Okay. Now, the actual answer if your moral and ethical quotient is very high, it is like this, of course, I will actually expose my friend, I will actually inform the examiner, I will stop him from copying not because I am afraid that I will not get a job, but because I am more concerned about him and I do not want him to get that job by doing some malpractice because he will lose his confidence in himself and he will become a highly dishonest fellow as he climbs up in the social ladder. In order to avoid this and teach him a lesson, so I will inform and it is better that it is nipped at the bud and then he does not develop this habit further. And if he is my true friend, he will realize my intention and then he will come back to me. I will apologize, I will make all possible reconciliations, I will make my channel open and I will wish that he understands me, but I will report to the invigilator. That is ethically good and correct way of behaving in that kind of situation. Uh, thank you so much for uh, listening to this. Now, there are some books that you can uh, refer to Bowie and Courtland et al. So, the book on uh, business communication today written by uh, Bowie and group published by Pearson education and there is also this book excellence in business communication again by Bowie and then uh, John V. Till. 
business communication process and product so this is by mary ellen cafe so this also a book that you can use it for uh, further reading and of course monopolies book on business communication strategies some very interesting and funny examples are uh, given here so which you can use it especially if you want to gain some personal insights so these anecdotal experiences are so powerful that you will not uh, forget them so easily so in this module if you look at it we had three lectures we started talking about the barriers to communication and while talking about it we focused initially on the kind of barriers which happened at the personal level and we also identified that whatever is happening is basically at the psychological level then the emotional level and then we try to see how we can resolve those barriers and to make the communication effective then we discussed in the second lecture of this module on the transactions which are happening at interpersonal level and how the barriers are there and in this part we focused more on the organizational setup where there are barriers and towards the end of it not only i talked about overcoming the barriers but also i talked to you about being ethical in your communication along with ways by which you can become a good communicator follow these tips try to inculcate this sense of ethical goodness in your communication you will not only become an effective communicator good communicator but an ethically effective communicator which is the need of the hour which is very important at uh, this stage this age that we are living in the age where uh, cyber crime is become so common your ethics is very important when you are communicating so hopefully i think that these three lectures in this module has contributed to giving you lots of tips on overcoming the barriers and making yourself an effective communicator go through these tips try to implement them in your day to day life and then progress day by day each day you try to use one or two tips which are given here and i am sure the day will come when you will become an effective communicator wish you all the best we'll meet in the next module until then i say bye and then wishing you once again good luck thank you